Welcome in week five. Uh, this time, this part of the week, we are going to focus on nudging. Before I start to introduce nudging, I would like to emphasize some organizational matters. First of all, those people who are allocated to the topic money should upload uh, their mini lecture Friday, October 2nd. Uh, you can uh, use, for instance, uh, WeTransfer. Uh, now, it's a good moment to think about exam as well. Uh, so if you have any questions regarding the exam, you can post those questions on Canvas uh, on a specific form that is listed there. This uh, forum will be open until uh, October 15, uh, until 5 p.m. So hurry up. For this week, but of course, also for the, uh, for the next week, um, there were a few readings allocated. First paper, paper by Rosen about uh, nudging to no obesity. A uh, brief paper uh, that shows uh, how we can nudge people uh, to make uh, healthier um, decisions. Then a uh, paper meta-analysis that introduced potential mechanism of uh, changes in self-control. As you will see later, self-control is the main mechanism that is responsible for healthy behavior. So in many cases, nudging addresses uh, changes, improvements uh, in self-control. And the final paper is a paper that introduces knowledge related to uh, the lack of gratification which is also related to self-control uh, and in this case it summarizes um, lots of uh, years of research of this psychological mechanism. Those of you who are interested in nudging, um, you may be interested in a book by Thaler and Sunstein. Uh, it's about uh, nudging, how we can improve decisions about health, wealth and happiness. Um, this book was published uh, a few years ago, but from time to time um, this uh, uh, book is uh, published again with some updates. Normally, in recent years, we've been studying papers uh, by one thing. So, for instance, uh, uh, one of his uh, famous paper uh, was about bottomless balls, but this paper, but also other papers, were retracted from the list of uh, uh, articles. Actually, all of papers but one thing were retracted due to the fact that he was accused um, of misconduct and this misconduct was proven. So, take into account that when you read his papers, basically uh, that can be considered as something that is not true. For this part, we're going to focus on two major aspects. First of all, I'm going to introduce nudging and its influence on uh, policy making. Uh, that would be a, a rather a broad perspective. Also important when we talk about uh, decision making and consumer behavior. And then we are going to focus on specific mechanisms that underlie health behavior and nudging health. This will help you to understand why actually nudging can work. So, first part, let's take into account policy making. Policy making can affect different type of behavior. For instance, in a healthy behavior like smoking, drinking, <coughs> drug use, Lack of exercise, of course, unhealthy diet, or stress, or behaviors that can lead to stress, like having too many duties. As you see, it's a pretty long list, and of course, this list could be extended. We could add more to it of something that can be seen as an unhealthy behavior. Like, for instance, to some extent, pollution or polluting. Okay, 
in the next part we have a TED video. Of course we are not going to see that right now but later on you can open slide and watch this brief video. It's not scientific video. It explains that some people struggle in their professional life to help other people to eat healthy or to live healthy. Watch the whole video and try to conclude what's the major problem of uh, unhealthy uh, behavior. Why people behave in uh, such a way. Is it uh, their fault? Is it the fault of their low self-control? Or maybe there are some specific patterns of behavior in society that uh, to some extent put this pressure to live in an unhealthy way. Sadly, in the next 18 minutes when I do our chat,
Another practical problem is related to the city of Amsterdam. As you probably know, Amsterdam is really popular amongst tourists. Many people every uh, year, every month, come to Amsterdam. Of course, during the corona crisis, it not, uh, the, the city is not as popular as it was before, but still many people uh, choose the city as a destination for a weekend or for um, uh, more days. They want to enjoy the city, they want to see restaurants and so on. For city, it's a problem. Too many people, too many tourists, um, changes completely how specific regions of the city function. More tourists, more pollution, more noise, uh, also that changes how people live in a city. Do you think it's related to health? To what extent it's related to health? Okay, we are not going to uh, answer to this question right now. We are going to discuss that during the online session. Imagine in practice, for instance, can happen or, or happened in Amsterdam, but also uh, that happens all over the world. In each large country, rich country of course, uh, there were or there are some units that are basically uh, busy uh, with changing how people make specific decisions, help them to live, for instance, uh, in a healthy way. So uh, Obama made uh, this effort, so he created a specific uh, team, it's called Social and Behavior Science Team, and by, uh, by running a uh, few projects, uh, at least uh, in the first year they did um, f uh, 15 projects, uh, one of the projects was uh, uh, related to the problem of matriculation. They found that 20-30% uh, of high school graduate accepted into college do not matriculate. That's a huge problem, that was a special problem for uh, poor kids. The easy thing that they did was sending them a reminder in a text message. And just the simple thing increased matriculation with 9%. That's a huge effect. Unfortunately, this team stopped to work in 2017. Guess why? Who did it? Mr. Trump, maybe? Yes, Mr. Trump. Similar project was established in UK as well. Um, in UK, it was a behavioral insight team and it was installed in the cabinet. They've been busy with different types of projects. If you want, you can open a slide and uh, under the slide you can find a link to a Wikipedia and you can read more about this specific interesting project. In conclusion, we can say that nudging, so modifying how people make specific decisions, related to health, education, and so on, it's really important and governments started to see its relevance. Of course, policy making, that's one thing. Creating effective product, uh, projects, that's another aspect. And third aspect is related to mechanisms. We are psychologists, so we want and we try to understand those mechanism through studying how uh, we function, how our behavior changes. In the second part, I would like to focus on mechanism. We can start from the basic mechanism and then later on focus on more advanced aspect. Specific behavior patterns, but also we are going to discuss uh, interaction between uh, brain processes and also developmental processes and later on social aspects of it. 
First of all, let's focus on the brain. Making decisions and how that happens in the brain, what kind of mechanisms are involved, was uh, studied in many, many different studies. Now I'd like to focus your attention on one of the uh, very interesting studies. In this study, they were trying to investigate uh, what happens in the brain, what causes a decision in terms of brain processes. In this um, graph, uh, on this figure, you can, uh, you can see brain scans. You can also see timeline and activation in different parts of the brain. And then also you can see the timeline of experiment. Let's focus on the bottom part of the experiment. Procedure was quite simple. People were presented with a product, and this product was presented for uh, four seconds. Later on, people were presented with a price. This price was present on a screen for another four seconds. And then after four seconds passed, people were asked to make a decision whether they would like to buy a product, yes, or no. They uh, were asked whether they would like to buy this product at specific price. In this case, we have uh, uh, chocolates, also name of, uh, of the brand as well, Godiva chocolate, and price $7. People were doing this kind of decisions, were making those decisions in an uh, fMRI scanner. So researchers were able to observe what happens in the brain at each stage of decision making. Typically, when we enter a store, we have a specific need. Uh, let's say we want to buy uh, something sweet. So we enter a shelf and we see a, a box of chocolates. Then we look at the price and then we think, do we want to buy it or not? Typically, this kind of process takes uh, around uh, 20, 30 seconds uh, between we see the product and we make a decision. So to some extent, this experiment replicates uh, natural conditions. But of course, in the normal store, it's not possible to observe what happens in the brain, but it's possible to observe that in a scanner. So they focus on three different part, different part of brains. First, it was the NACC. That was a, a part of the brain that was responsible for uh, making uh, impulsive actions. So for creating emotions deep uh, in deeper part of the brain, we could say. Uh, in the emotional part of the brain. On the other hand, they were observing uh, parts of the brain that are responsible for um, self-awareness or more conscious uh, decisions, like insula. What is specific in this experiment is that when specific parts of the brain were activated, and this is what you can see in the middle part of the screen. If a product was purchased, and that's the uh, black line, darker line, it shows on a specific, uh, at a specific moment, a strong activation in uh, the emotional part of the brain. So, if a participant saw a box of chocolate and then saw uh, a prize, and then activation in uh, the emotional part of the brain spiked, later on, this product was purchased. It means that if we see a product and we feel that we really like it, so uh, this part of the brain that is responsible for creating emotional experience activates, that leads to yes decision. On the other hand, if you take a look at the uh, um, lighter 
part of the graph, the gray one, you see that it's aligned for a situation when a product was not purchased. It means that if a specific product does not activate an uh, emotional part of the brain, we as consumers, uh, we probably will not buy it. Okay, now let's take a look at the left part, so right part of the, of the graph. On the right part of the graph, we have activation in the insula. So uh, let's say a part of the brain that is responsible for self-consciousness, more conscious decision. As you see here, uh, at the later stage of this uh, decision-making, so uh, after the uh, participants were asked whether they would like to buy or not, Activation in this part of the brain was stronger when the product was not purchased than when it was purchased. It means that, that this part of the brain is more active in saying no, I'm not going to buy this nice um, box of chocolate. One of the important conclusions of this research is that sometimes before we make a decision, yes or no, our brain activates specific regions of the brain and later on that can lead to a specific decision. If emotional part is activated, that may lead to yes a decision if it's related to something pleasant, like for example buying chocolate that later on can produce lots of uh, pleasure. or if we do not want to buy a um, uh, specific product that is um, um, related to activation in more um, in different regions responsible for making more conscious decisions. Okay, so we know based on this slide that specific mechanisms in the brain are involved in making decisions about buying healthy um, uh, this, uh, products. Now, let's take a look at behavioral aspects. Because you might think that people make decisions to live unhealthy because it's easier to live unhealthy way. So, in this research, they were trying to investigate hypotheses whether laziness or optimization of effort can explain why in some cases people live in an unhealthy way. Here, you see two locations of vegetables in the middle of uh, between tables so uh, on the left hand side the middle bowl was harder to reach during uh, breakfast and if uh, researchers put their vegetables uh, or healthy uh, food it was harder to reach thus people were selecting that less often on the other hand on the right hand side we have uh, allocation of products that were easier to reach. So, for instance, if uh, uh, healthy food was presented on opposite sides of, uh, of a large table, uh, people were basically selecting more this kind of healthy food. And Rosin and the authors, they tried to discuss whether, maybe in many cases, people simply optimize the effort. So instead of um, cooking healthy diet, they decide to order pizza because it's basically optimization of the effort. People, they maybe want to save the energy for something more important than just preparing food. Maybe that's uh, to some extent an uh, evolutionary uh, mechanism that causes those kind of effects and sometimes misleads um, us uh, and makes us um, obese, for instance, if we consume too much unhealthy food. So, the question is that maybe people compensate between effort and the outcome. In this case, specific type of food. You can ask a question, what are the limitations of this kind of thinking? Is it really optimization of effort? Is it something that uh, is a plausible uh, explanation for this case? Let's consider another type of mechanism. 
This mechanism is related to uh, age. This graph it shows specific problem. In different European countries, but also in the United States, they investigated how many children of age 11, 13 and 15 are overweight. And they compared stats between 2001 and 2010. As you see, almost in each country, the number of obese or overweight children increased. In some countries like Poland or Czech Republic, the increase was very, very large. Similarly for United States. So the change was from 24% almost to 30%. 30% of children in the United States are aware of obese in 2010. Probably and now it's even larger. That's astonishing result. Now let's ask a question, yeah, why that happens? What causes this kind of effect? We can observe that uh, that's a huge effect, but what kind of mechanisms are responsible for this? Can we change that? One of the ways of modifying behavior is nudging. To some extent, the simple change of location of healthy food can be seen as nudging, as a way to change behavior. This the problem of nudging was investigated quite a long time ago by Tal and Sunstein, and they define that in this way. A nudge is in any aspect of the choice architecture that alters people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options or significantly changing incentives. To count as a mere nudge, the intervention must be easy and cheap to avoid. Nudges are not mandates. Putting the fruit at the eye level counts as a nudge. Banning junk food does not. Think for a second what it implies. What kind of aspects this definition is related to. Of course, it emphasizes that nudges cannot be something that is mandatory. It should be voluntary. It also should be cheap and simple. They also say that nudging is about promoting desired choice without prohib prohibiting the undesired choice. In this case, it's a something, a situation that creates autonomous choice. So complies is not forced. Makes use of positive reinforcements and the way people perceive information and make decisions. So, in order to create successful match, we have to understand how in specific area people make their decisions. Thirdly, it combines knowledge from psychology and behavioral economics research fields. So, to be a good nudge makers, we need to not only know mechanisms related to human psychology, but also related to behavioral economics. So we need to be, to some extent, experts in both fields. Why people make unhealthy decisions? In this part, we're going to focus on elements that will help us how people make unhealthy decisions and thus help us to develop successful nudges. That's important to create successful nudges, to understand those mechanisms. So first of all, we know from research that when people make decisions, they rely on standards and feedback. So if there is not good standard, if there is no enough feedback, people may, can make unhealthy decisions. Also, we understand that if it's easier to grab unhealthy food, then people will do it. So, effort that people need to make to uh, obtain food is important. The easier 
the food is uh, to be obtained, uh, the higher is the chance that this food will be consumed. And, three, and thirdly, we have two mechanisms related to uh, how people think about future. So the first mechanism, temporal discarding or delaying gratification. And finally, one of the reasons why people make an unhealthy decision is fatigue self-control or decision fatigue that can lead to uh, unhealthy decisions. For instance, uh, lack of exercising, eating unhealthy food or drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes. Since we know that, we can try to think when nudging works best. First of all, since we know that the problem of delaying gratification is important, so maybe nudging can deliver benefits now and make people to see costs later. What does it mean? It means that if we want to use a successful nudge, some benefits should be visible right away, instantly. Think for a second how that would be related to food, if we would like to change how people make decisions uh, what they want to have for dinner. Also, what research showed was that, that nudging is really successful when People have to make difficult choice. People want to avoid effort. So nudging can be really helpful when people are confronted with difficult choices. What that can be? Of course, not uh, what to prepare for, uh, for dinner. But a difficult choice can be when people need to select amongst number of options. So uh, if we want to make people to uh, uh, eat healthy. Maybe instead of presenting 60 types of uh, food in the menu, maybe it's better to present three or four healthy options and one unhealthy option. That increases the chance that more people will select uh, healthy options, right? Also, what was found in the research that nudging is really successful when people make rare decisions. When it comes to uh, uh, choosing what kind of food to eat, it's not a uh, rare decision. But there are other decisions related, for instance, uh, where to live, what kind of apartment to buy. And it was found that if people are nudged when making this kind of decisions, for instance, uh, uh, where to uh, study master degree, this in this situation, nudging can be really successful. Also, it was found that nudging is really successful if the feedback is scarce. So, if people do not often get um, uh, feedback. Also, final mechanism is related to when you are not certain what you like. So, nudging can help people to want to know what they really like. You will see examples later on, for instance, related to exercising, that will explain why. One of the main mechanisms is that, that nudging can suggest people that something that they never tried can be really fun. And based on this small pleasure, this small fun, people can like specific activities. Let's investigate step-by-step -step specific mechanism that can or cannot make um, nudging successful. Think about the simple test. Which option would you prefer? 100 euros now or 120 euros in a month? And now, let's consider this one. Which option would you prefer? 100 euros in a year or 120 in a year in a month. Typically, when the first test is introduced, people would choose, of course, 100 euros now. This is what happens. That's the mechanism. But 
if a different temporal perspective is pre uh, presented, then the people switch their uh, decision. Instead of 100 in a year, they would prefer 120. It's the different discounting function. If something is delayed in time, uh, people go for the higher output. In this case, it would be 120. Yeah, if uh, wait uh, a year, and why not a year in a, uh, in a month, right? Temporal discounting is the difference in relative uh, valuation placed on rewards. Usually it's uh, money or goods uh, at different points uh, in time. By comparing its uh, valuation at an early date with one or for a later date. Basically, it means that present rewards are valued higher than the future rewards. One of the explanations as as you see on the slide. First of all, people can be seen as impulsive, so it's a specific trait. Those people who are more impulsive, they will uh, go for more immediate rewards. But also, on the other hand, that can be explained in terms of more um, state aspects. So for instance, at specific moment, people may have this stronger need to uh, for immediate gratification. One of the best examples of this need to immediate gratification is a marshmallow test. On the next slide, you can find brief video. Probably you know this experiment. It's really well known in psychology. It shows how kids behave when they are confronted with a treat. And what happens if they are promised to get another uh, treat if they will wait with eating the first one? Of course, we are not going to watch that now. You can watch it uh, later on. When watching the video, try to think what kind of processes uh, in those small uh, children um, can be identified? What happens in their minds when they are confronted with this kind of uh, situation? Okay, let's move on.
One of the most sensible explanation of the effects that were observed in this marshmallow test are related to brain studies. On this slide you see uh, on the left hand side different regions of brain that were studied during those experiments. On the right part of this graph you see white circles. Those white circles they indicate those part of brain that are responsible for intelligence, conscious decisions, rationality. The yellow part is an emotional part of brain, amygdala, let's say. The white part are ACC, so the region that is responsible for inhibition, or prefrontal cortex that is responsible for thinking. And researchers, they found that in children, five, seven years old, there are differences between how strong those parts of the brain can be activated. And that can be described as sensitivity to rewards, the gray part on the right-hand side of the whole slide. As you see here, when people are five, seven years old, their sensitivity to rewards, so this ability for the emotional part of the brain to activate is stronger than this tendency in the uh, prefrontal uh, part of the brain. That slightly changes uh, over time. Another tendency is described as sensitivity to punishment. So younger children do not learn so well from, from punishment. The negative feedback, this is what we can say here, we are not talking here about uh, physical punishment, we are talking about negative feedback. Uh, they are less sensitive to negative information, like for instance uh, to the fact that they can be obese, so they, they cannot run as fast, uh, so that obesity uh, is a problem. But later on, when they become older and older, for instance 15-16 years old, the sensitivity to punishment to learn from negative feedback overcomes the sensitivity to rewards. And that's a crucial part of uh, the whole process of uh, development. As you see here, people, um, young kids, five, uh, seven years old, they cannot deal well with the marshmallow test because they are very sensitive to rewards. So they cannot successfully inhibit their reactions and they consume more often than older children. They cannot wait so long as the other ones. Of course, some people are more, some people are less impulsive, but still this pattern related to age um, is pretty stable. Okay, let's take a look at another mechanism that explains why in some cases people make unhealthy decisions. It's a hyperbolic discounting. It's a tendency for people to increasingly choose a smaller sooner word over a larger later word as the delay occurs sooner rather than later in time. The scouting in this case is not time consistent. Uh, it's a curvilinear relationship. It's basically linked strongly to utility theory. I hope that you remember that from previous lectures. Valuation fall rapidly for early delay periods, from now to one week, or more slowly for long, uh, longer delay periods, 10, 21 weeks, for instance. Let's take a look at example, how that actually looks in studies. In a study by Reed and uh, Van Leeuwen, that was the procedure. People were asked to choose now something that will, they will eat next week. So the question was, if you were deciding today, would you choose fruit or chocolate for next week? What people decided to do? In 
if this question was asked, they decided to choose fruit. 74% of them decided to choose fruit. So today, decision is made, something for next week, people go for something healthy. More healthy than chocolate. But if decision was uh, about something different, so if you were deciding today, what would you choose to eat today? People selected chocolate. 70% in this condition uh, chose chocolate. That explains this hyperbolic effect. Let's apply this mechanism to uh, health. Temporal discounting means that the value of a reward decreases with delay of its uh, receipt. The problem with health is that, that most health goals, for instance, uh, being physically fit, losing weight, better overall height, take time. So the reward is delayed. Uh, that happens in the future. So it's worth less if you would compare to the reward right now. So uh, losing weight can be seen as a long-term goal or it's typically confronted with short-term temptations. It's really important to take that into account. Of course, this is uh, only a study. It's, uh, it's just uh, one evidence. So let's take a look at accumulation of evidence. In a meta-analysis by Barlow 2016, they found an effect of time discounting on unhealthy diets and obesity. In this meta-analysis, time discounting, or the hyperbolic discounting, was linked to motivational processes, explaining that some people have this inability to follow through despite initial motivation. Which means that even though some people have this strong motivation to lose weight, they do not gain their goal. But there were some moderators of the effect. Typically people are not really successful at those long-term goals, but there are some differences. They found that this effect was stronger for younger people. So younger people, uh, compared to older people, are not able to um, delay gratification well. Also they found that this tendency to temporal discounting is stronger for people with lower socioeconomic status. And also it's stronger for less educated people. Think for a second and try to explain why that's the case. They analyzed 41 studies, 76 were cross-sectional studies, and in those studies they found positive correlation between time discounting, obesity, and unhealthy diets. On the other hand, experimental studies show that lower time discounting was associated with greater weight loss. So we can conclude that there is moderate evidence that high time discounting is a risk factor for unhealthy diets and obesity. That's a huge problem. And we also know that it's moderated by age, socioeconomic status, or for instance, education. Okay, let's take a look at another aspect that explain how people make decisions, specifically unhealthy decisions, and later on that will help us to create maybe successful nudges. We've discussed temporal discounting and now let's focus on fatigue self-control. I hope that you remember from previous slides that self-control can be understood as a process, so in this case self-control can be depleted, 
but also can be related to trade. Um, in this case, trade are patterns in thinking and in behavior. Fatigue self-control is basically related to uh, um, a phenomenon that explains why in some cases people make unhealthy decisions. So if uh, we are full, then probably we'll select healthy food. It's, in this case, relatively easier. But if you are depleted, chances to buy unhealthy food increases. So suggestion is that never go shopping when you are hungry, as the simple graph indicates. Fatigue self-control is also related to different aspects, not only to make um, unhealthy or uh, healthy decisions at the store. It was found that both researchers and general public often see that lack of control, no, willpower, is an important factor that leads to failing at dieting. And in the research, we can find evidence that confirms that. Dieting and trying to lose weight, it's uh, widespread and concerns a lot of people in America, but of course also in Europe. Uh, in the Netherlands, around 30% of Dutch people think about their weight. They want to lose weight uh, at some point. 50% uh, of respondents uh, in the United States believe that obesity is uh, basically a result of specific uh, choices that people make, but also a lack of willpower. That leads to a, a specific attribution. So if uh, around 50% of people think that it's a trait, then also they may think that's a fault of other people because they do not have enough self-control. On the other hand, 75 respondents indicated that lack of willpower was preventing them from losing weight. So also these people think that's their own problem because they do not have enough willpower. But research found that obesity is mainly caused by a mixture of genes and specific environmental and social factors. So it's not us, not our traits, but something that uh, creates our biology or other social factors. So how easy is to gain unhealthy food? Think for a second about uh, your own environment. In Netherlands, we have those uh, spots where we can buy mostly unhealthy food, chocolate, chips, and so on. We, if we give to our friends uh, chocolates for birthday, for instance, if a weekend is coming, we buy chips, we buy beer, wine, and we eat unhealthy because we like to indulge. So, is it your willpower or maybe there are many factors outside specific patterns in behavior that doesn't help us to lose weight? Finally, let's consider self-control as a trait. Can we do anything about it? We believe that trait self-control, willpower, is an important element. But is that really matter? when we make specific decisions. Later on, at the end of the course, I will show you some evidence that proves that this trait can be also modified. But first, let's focus on research that shows to what extent trait self-control is involved in uh, decision-making. Some people think that next to IQ, so intelligence, self-control is really important psychological trait. Some people treat trait self-control as a resource available to use. It means that if your trait self-control is high, then you can way easier deal with depleting conditions than people with lower level of trait self-control. So 
keeping on dieting would be easier for people with higher trait self-control. So maybe if you want to lose weight, uh, stay healthy, drink less alcohol and so on, maybe you first of all should focus on building trait self-control, building those resources. In research by Hillebart and the reader, they found that high self-control was linked to weaker conflict between alternative goals. So it means that for people with high level of trait self-control, this temporal discarding was not as a huge problem as for people with lower self-control. And the reason why people with higher the level of self-control uh, are successful is that they do not feel conflict between long-term, short-term goals. So if I, if I would have high level of self-control and if I would think, okay, do I want to eat chocolate now or fruit, it will not be a problem. I would go for a fruit. It would be, let's say, easier for me to explain myself that eating a fruit is a, be a better thing to do at this moment. They also found that people with higher trait self-control, uh, for those people, um, it's easier to make um, long-term uh, decisions. So choose uh, uh, healthy food because they do not experience high uh, emotional arousal as people um, low in self-control. Also, people high in trait self-control, they experience weaker impulses if they are con confronting uh, a treat. That's really astonishing because it means that if the arousal is lower, maybe it's better, um, <clears throat> it's easier to make a more rational decision. So people can decide easier what's better for them. And finally, in this research they found that people who have higher trait self-control, they need to make less effort in controlling resources. It's really interesting uh, data. Because, for instance, if you need to con confront uh, a treat, let's say, to eat or not to eat a bar of chocolate, for people with higher uh, self-control, it's easier, so they need to use less resources, less self-control resources, to deal with this kind of situation than people with lower level of trait self-control. That's a really fascinating result. Okay. I hope that I explained you how people make decisions about unhealthy and other aspects. And I think that explains when and how we can create successful nudges. On one hand, situational factors matters, but also it matters um, how people are prepared for making specific decisions, depending on their training, their traits, and also their age. Thank you for your attention.